Nova Scotia is home to many museums and our museum landscape is complex. CCTH, or the department, funds the provincial museum system, the 28 sites that are known collectively as the Nova Scotia Museum. The department also funds 63 community museums as well as the Black Cultural Center, Joggins Fossil Institute, and we also provide funding to the Mi'kma'wi Debert Cultural Center project. Beyond this, there are many more community museums, private museums, and national historic sites, such as the Halifax Citadel and Fortress Lewisburg. As anybody who has ever visited a local museum or historic place, I'm sure you all have, uh, knows that there are sites that are just more than tourist attractions. They connect different generations, bring, help bring our community together, and teach visitors about our province. This is true across all of Nova Scotia, of course, but is particularly true in rural Nova Scotia, where there are often few alternatives to learn about our history or experience arts and cultural programs. Our 2019 visitor exit survey, so this is tourists that are coming to visit the province, um, reveals that over 15% of all visitors to Nova Scotia included a visit to a museum and or historic site during their stay. With a total of 2.3 million visitors to the province, this translates to approximately 370,000 visitors engaging with a museum or historic site as part of their Nova Scotia experience. That is significant. Museums and historic sites play a crucial role in showcasing the diversity of our province and supporting communities such as African Nova Scotians, Mi'kmaq, Gales, and Acadians in staying connected with their cultures and heritages. And above all this, these institutions serve as vibrant hubs of economic and cultural activity, supporting the tourism and screen industries, providing local employment opportunities, and supporting small businesses and local community groups. In short, there are many ways that museums and historic sites support their local communities, which is why this department has made it a priority to do more to support them. It starts with ensuring that there is an adequate funding base. In the 2023-24 budget, we allocated an additional, sorry, allocated an additional $7.2 million in annual operating funds for arts, culture, and heritage organizations. This included $5.1 million more for arts, culture, and heritage organizations, including community theaters, museums, events, festivals, multicultural community groups, and a boost of $2.1 million for locally managed Nova Scotia museum sites. This increase in funding, the first since 2008, <coughs> is intended to address salary increases and operational pressures at museum sites across Nova Scotia. We are helping 180 cultural and heritage organizations and 17 provincial museums remain on strong financial footing, especially with respect to staff retention and the ability to pay the bills. Equally important is that we are working closely with the sector, having conversations about developing diverse revenue streams to ensure long-term sustainability. I don't want to leave the impression that money alone is enough. Many of these museums and heritage sites depend on the active support of local volunteers and the pride of entire communities. You can't reduce this contribution to a balance sheet. But what stable funding does do is provide these organizations with the ability to invest in their communities and plan for the future with confidence. We've also been addressing gaps and redundancies in the Nova Scotia's museum's interpretation, expanding stories to be more diverse and inclusive, and providing a $100,000 interpretive renewal fund to Nova Scotia museum sites. For instance, we are providing funds for an interpretive renewal project at the Acadian Village, and we are also supporting the North Hills Museum in developing content before the Congress Mondial. And then there's the African Nova Scotian Seafarers Project, a collaborative effort between the Fisheries Museum of the Atlantic, the Black Cultural Center, and the Black Loyalist Heritage Center that raises awareness of the untold story of African Nova Scotians' seafaring experience. These are all fantastic examples of how we're helping the Nova Scotia Museum sites tell a wider range of stories in ways that are both diverse and inclusive. Funding for museums and historical sites allows Nova Scotians to serve as stewards to our remarkable shared heritage and ensure the lessons of the past are never forgotten. This leads to stronger, more robust communities with more dynamic cultural life and a stronger appeal to visitors from home and abroad. Or as I like to put it, while funding museums and heritage sites may seem like preserving the past, it really is an investment in a brighter future for all of us. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide opening remarks, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. 
Thank you, Deputy. So now we move on to the questioning portion of the meeting. Each caucus will have 20 minutes for the first round and then we'll divvy up uh, the remaining time. We will begin now with the Liberal Caucus, MLA McGuire. Uh, good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Um, Art Gallery. We'll start with that right quick, if you don't mind. Uh, we know it's closed for renos, obviously. Um, <laughs> What's the cost on the maintenance and upkeep on the art gallery and uh, just a timeline on when we can expect it to open? Deputy um, Houston. And it's uh, original site there. Sure. Deputy Houston. Um, I don't have the breakdown of the, the maintenance and the cost. So are you looking, and I can provide that for you. So are you looking for the annual maintenance and operating costs or for this work that needs to be done or both? Uh, Emily McGuire. Looking for the for the for cost of the work. Sorry. Yeah, and then yeah, we you know what we'll do both. Yeah, yeah if you don't mind. Yeah. Deputy Houston. Sure. So we can follow up with you with that information. Both both there and the timeline that we're looking at right now is mid May for for that work to be done for the museum to be reopened, uh, and so we can provide updates on that as needed. But we're certainly keen to have that open ready for uh, the primary tour season. Emily McGuire. So obviously at one point I think there was talk of um, building a new art gallery. Um, do you know, uh, just because I, I don't know off the top of my head, what, what was the price of that? Like what was, what did that, I know there were some uh, costs that had ballooned in, because of inflation and, and uh, I think COVID had an impact on it and all that. Uh, so I'm just wondering what was, the, what was the cost at the time when the project was put on pause? Yeah, Compared to the original cost, sorry. Deputy Houston. Sure. I may have that um, here. If not, I can provide that as well. But essentially, I, th I think I know that the cost, uh, the quotes that we got in were at least 25% higher than what, what the uh, initial budget was earmarked for. I think in, in my head, I think I have 137 million. Um, yep. Okay, good. I read my notes correctly. Uh, 137 million was the, the estimated budget, but when we got back uh, estimates, we were looking at 25% over at the time. So, like like everything, costs are escalating, and um, given some of the other priorities of government, the decide was to put a pause on it, the project. But that um, will continue. Emily McGuire. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's understandable when I mean, I. Uh, I graduated high school with grade 10 math, so forgive me for not knowing 25% of 137 million, but I'm thinking it's probably around another extra 30 million or 40 million, somewhere around there. Uh, so obviously, you know, when you're spending close to $200 million, I don't want to say on a luxury, but on, on, on an art gallery, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's understandable. Um, the the, the um, repairs and the renovations that are being done to the art gallery, do you think they'll be, what, what will be the time frame and the, li uh, the life uh, extension of the art gallery due to these maintenances, maintenance and repairs? Um, Deputy Houston? Uh, that, that's a good question. I mean, it's a, it is a historical building, so there's probably other things, other factors to go into it, but they are going to be replacing it with a, I believe it's with a steel roof, uh, which has quite a long lifetime, uh, new windows. The key was is around, particularly for safety, is the fire suppression system. So that was the key aspect, which is requires the full overhaul and the closing down of the gallery, is they have to bring out all the, the sprinkler systems and pipes and replace those. So. I think once those are in, if those are the factor, that's a quite a long lifetime, decades. Um, but again, it is a historical building, so there are other aspects of upkeeping of any historical property. Emily McGuire. A steel roof this close to the ocean? <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, I don't know. I, I just know that uh, I've seen, like, you know, I, you obviously know where I, I live and where, so down that way, down here in Cove Sandbury area, I don't see many steel roofs, and the ones that I do are not in the best of shape, so maybe things have changed a bit, but uh, I don't know. Uh, does that sound, I, I don't know, that just struck me as kind of strange that you're putting a steel roof this close to salty air and water. Deputy Houston. Uh, even though I did work as a roofer for two summers, uh, <laughs> I, I am not. I am not a specialist on, on roofing systems, uh, so I'll defer. You know, that's a question for Public Works in terms of the, their upkeep. Public Works is the department that's responsible for upkeep. It is a uh, provincial asset, so we work with them in partnership with them, and they're the ones that are managing those renovations. Emily McGuire. 
I did roofing one summer too. It is brutal in the summer, absolutely brutal. Uh, so I get a lot of respect every time I drive by and see uh, those people up on the roofs working. I just, ugh, it's not an easy job. Uh, one of the things uh, that you that you touched on was historical sites, and I just want to go local for a quick second. Um, something that. Um, you know, I've been advocating for quite some time. It is a federal historic site. I do know that uh, sometimes we see um, federal, municipal, and provincial cooperation on these sites. And um, I'm sure you've been to the site many times, but I'm sure everybody around here has York Redoubt, for example. Uh, uh, has It's fallen apart. I mean, it really is. I mean, everything's shut down. Um, the buildings that when I, we were younger, we used to go into those buildings as part of our school trips, all shut down. The tunnels are all... You know, they're all, everything's shut down. The, the, the walls are falling down. Uh, it's not in the best of shape. And, and I will say, in fairness, I've reached out to my MP, Andy Fillmore, several times on this one. Um, is there, at any point, uh, even though it's a national historic site, um, does the province get involved and say, reach out to their federal counterparts and say, you know, like, we have some sites here um, that, that aren't doing the best? Um, you know, when or can we expect, uh, you know, money and funding for this? I think, I think sometimes with sites like York Redoubt, it's because it's out of sight, out of mind. You know, if this was Citadel Hill or, um, uh, forgive me, I forget, the, what's the island there? George's Island. Um, you know, everybody sees it, so I think uh, we rush to invest to make sure it all looks great. Um, but there are a lot of sites, national historic sites around this province that are falling apart. Um, so, so from a provincial standpoint, not that you need to do any more work, but uh, do you do you consider um, reaching out to your federal counterparts? And has there ever been any conversations about York Redoubt in particular? Deputy Houston. Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, so to answer your last last question, no, I haven't been involved in any specific conversations around York Redoubt, although we do uh, have conversations with our colleagues at Heritage Canada or Parks Canada. And certainly that is something that I will raise with them, uh, given that you flagged it here today. Um, we, do, we typically... Uh, we'll have conversations around how do we work better together in terms of some synergies or how do we capitalize on some of the work that they're doing in some of the, the federal parks or historic sites uh, in line with either our uh, museums or heritage sites or interpretive uh, programs. So it, it's, it's an ongoing dialogue and it's certainly something that I can raise in terms of specifically around York Redoubt in the future for that and future federal investments. But I, again, I would encourage you probably the best path because it is a federal site is working with uh, your local MP. Emily McGuire. Yeah, and I have, and just I know that uh, you frequent the area sometimes, so uh, you know next time you're down there, just you know take a pop in and take a look around, and I think most people uh, would be a little surprised in the shape and, and the condition of York Redoubt right now. Um, and it, you know it's sad, uh, but I also understand that there there it's a federal, um, it's federal. So uh, yeah, just something I wanted to put on your radar, and maybe next time you have a conversation with your federal counterparts, and I'll, I'll continue to do the same with my MB. Uh, you could you could reach out and um, talk to them about that. Um, um, what's the what's the budget for provincial heritage sites this year and last year? Do you know? Deputy Houston. So, so I, I want to just. Um, we don't actually have provincial heritage sites, and and that's uh, I think something I wanted to make sure that we were clear about here today. So. Heritage sites or historic sites, those are federal, but we do have a, a heritage property program. And in that budget, there is a, a roughly $200,000 annually that can go towards um, helping uh, properties that are registered as a provincial heritage property, which is different from any municipal registered property, uh, that they can apply for funding to help offset costs to maintain that heritage status. Emily McGuire. <coughs> Obviously, COVID, I think we can say, had an impact on tourism, obviously. Um, and, and part of our tourism is our, our museum and museums. Um, do you collect data on uh, the sites and how many people have visited? Um, do we know uh, the year before COVID and then during COVID and then now that we're out of COVID, what the numbers look like? 
Deputy Houston, and uh, you have uh, just uh, uh, 10 minutes left in your, in sure. your questioning. Uh, well, Houston. let me respond in a, in a general sense, then I'll, I'll um, well, let me start with your last part. We don't have that data here today, but we can for not all sites, but for some sites we can provide 2000, what I would say is 2019 is your best year for that pre-COVID, and then we can look at what our last visitation was over this season. I'm not sure if we have the data yet for this year, uh, but generally speaking, we're, we are seeing a significant rebound, and I think you've seen some of the media around just I think it was either today or yesterday around uh, Halifax Airport and the, and the percentage or the number of flights that are coming back. Uh, we're certainly seeing that in the tourism sector as well. We're close to, but we are not yet at 2019 levels. But certainly um, the, the return is looking very positive and I would hope or suspect that next year we will be at or exceeding 2019 levels. Emily McGuire. Excellent, because I mean, we do know how important tourism is to Nova Scotia, but really, I, I would say, in particular, to some of the rural areas of Nova Scotia. Um, what, what, I mean, obviously, you have uh, really good staff and a lot of knowledge in the department. Uh, what has been the plan? Like, what, what, what do you feel has uh, obviously, you know, uh, people are back again and we're out and we're doing things, but there, what has been the plan from the department uh, to increase? tourism and to get back to pre-COVID levels? Deputy Houston. Uh, great, great question. Um, so from, there's a couple of aspects there and one would be, I would say sort of is the more macro, which is around, we are working uh, very hard with folks like our federal colleagues, Destination Canada, as well as our Atlantic colleagues uh, around marketing Canada, Atlantic Canada and Nova Scotia as a destination. So a part of the challenge coming back from uh, COVID is re, um, you know, everybody kind of went stayed home. Everybody kind of, they changed their patterns of how they're traveling, of where they're focusing. And so across the world, really, and particularly across North America, everybody's been, uh, for lack of a better word, competing to get back out in front and help remind people about what a great place, in our case, Nova Scotia is to travel. So that's an aspect of it. Transportation and flights has been a, a key issue as well. Uh, so that's some work that we're doing uh, as well, working very closely with uh, the airport uh, and other partners in Atlantic Canada. Um, a key part of our tourism strategy as well has been looking at how do we focus on supporting uh, communities and regions to highlight the best of what they have to offer to travelers. So um, that has been a key a focus for this government, has been looking at how do we support local organizations, businesses and municipalities or direct marketing organizations uh, in regions to highlight the best of what, of what they uh, have to offer, as I said. Um, Seasonality is another key issue. So we are, we know that we from, you know, July particularly to the September, we're pretty good. Um, but it's those shoulder seasons and ideally off seasons where we know that's where we need to grow uh, our visitation. And we're doing that through things like our event strategy where we are specifically focusing on trying to attract events, not during July and August, although it's great because we need those, those two, but how do we look at you know, bringing events to, to rural communities in, in March, in February? Uh, and so that's where we're looking at making a lot of our investment there. Uh, and then there's the other aspect I would just say, and not to eat up your time, is around digital, um, you know, w digital literacy and helping uh, businesses, organizations have a presence online and have uh, platforms that uh, is what the market wants to see. So as everybody knows now, no one, no one's kind of looking up the yellow pages anymore of trying to figure out where to go. You pull up your phone, you look, you're in a new city, you look and see, you know, best, you know, restaurant, uh, and then that's what comes up. And so we need to help our businesses who provide amazing products and services be visible to those visitors that are coming to the province and be able to serve, provide programs and services in the way that they want it. Emily McGuire. You're showing your age when you say the yellow pages. I, 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 got, I, got, I got the yellow pages a little while ago in the mail and my son was there with me and I pulled it out of the mail and he said, what in the heck is that? And I said, well, let me tell you about a simpler time. Uh, so I, I will say this, uh, you did some great stuff with the Aid for Adventure guys and girls, uh, fantastic stuff. And I think where it really was 
special, I think, is what they were able to do around the winter stuff. And it was for the first time ever I was seeing uh, stuff coming out about what can you do in Nova Scotia in the winter. And it actually made me want to go uh, camping and tenting in the winter. So I called one of the guys up and said, let's go, right? And they said, I don't think you could survive the winter. <laughs> uh, but no, I think you did some really good stuff there. And I think that really helps, especially the social media stuff. Uh, the, I, uh, there was the Fortress Lewisburg stuff where, where where they really promote it and showed. But I think the winter stuff in particular, I don't think people really see that. And that kind of opens things up a little bit. Um, and I know it's not your department, but I think there is some, there's potential for collaboration between yourself and the Department of Natural Resources, where our parks aren't open in the winter time. But they're open, but they're not, if you know what I mean. Like, uh, so I'll give you a long like provincial park, for example. Uh, you know, the, it's gated, it's closed. So you pull up and you're just like, it's not welcoming. And I understand like from a maintenance standpoint and all that. But there is a real big opportunity for snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, and, and, and I think um, when we talk about winter destinations, we think of Jasper, and we think of BC, and we think of Alberta, and things like that. We think of skiing, and we think of outdoor activities, and, and I, I think there are, that is part of the tourism in Nova Scotia that... Uh, I don't want to say it's missing, but I, I think we just scratched the surface. So uh, it was, it was when I was seeing those um, the social media stuff with the A for Adventure guys. Uh, it was fantastic, and then the I don't know if you remember. I know you do, but the the Paggy's Cove, mm -hmm. the Paggy's Cove picture that they did, which was amazing. Uh, when you walk into my house, that's the first thing you see is that picture, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that really goes a long way to promoting. And I had people reach out to me from all across Canada, some people from the state saying, "Is that how you guys play hockey?" Like, you know. And I, I really want to come to Nova Scotia now to to see this stuff. So, is there? Are you? Again, like it's, I think it's easier to draw people in in the summertime, the beauty of Cape Breton and Nova Scotia and all over the place. But are you looking at really putting some more emphasis and, and doing some more of that digital mm -hmm. advertising with groups like that? I mean, it doesn't have to be them, but I mean, they, they did a great job, but others like that to really promote and show the energy that we can have here in Nova Scotia in the wintertime. Three minutes, Deputy Houston. And you can finish it. Uh, no, good, good questions, and I'll answer that, and I'll use it to pivot to another area, too. Um, so, yes, absolutely, that is something that we're focused on. Um, in, in terms of, like, showing your age as well, uh, the, the difference now around where we invest, we invest in social media influencers. So the new a new era of marketing is where we will pay folks that have a lot of followers on Instagram and they will come and they will experience a winter experience like A for Adventure or there's others that might come from the states that have big following in our target markets in Northeast US, for example. So we'll work with them, we'll bring them up, we'll set them up and they will experience a package which they have to have a certain number of posts and a certain number of likes and follows and, and that's how the world is working as well. So um, winter is absolutely a focus. Um, one of the things that we're looking at, to, to your point, we are looking at exploring some pilots around uh, winter park openings. It, as you can appreciate, not every region or park is equal in, in, in terms of what they can... So there's things that the locals would like, like I think Long Lake is an example. And there's others, if we're trying to expand tourism, like we, there needs to be a bit of an ecosystem of services that surround that. So accommodations, restaurants that are open in the winter. So part of that comes down to even things like winterizing and energy efficiency. So it's a big piece, but we are looking at that. The other thing I would say in terms of growing tourism, this is what I want to pivot into, is that we are also making conscious efforts to be more inclusive and diverse in who we represent in some of those social media ads. So. We want to make sure that people understand that Nova Scotia just isn't uh, tartans and um, you know summer uh, summer scenes of sailing. It, there are diverse communities here uh, that have been here for um, time immemorial in the Mi'kmaq or for 400 years in terms of African Nova Scotians, Acadians, Gales that we can d demonstrate that Nova Scotia is for everyone and there are huge target markets that I think we can really tap into uh, because of that. So. Emily McGuire, <laughs> just under one minute. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, and, and obviously, um, 
you know, we all want our parks open in the winter time, but if, we, if we're going to do it, you're going to need uh, the amenities around it. Uh, another question that I, I, we can't really get into right now, but uh, I just think of a place like Long Lake, for example, and obviously it's in my backyard, so that's why I'm using it, but, uh, and Crystal Crescent Beach and things like that. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. There's no amenities at all at Crystal Crescent Beach. Uh, there's no amenities at all at Long Lake Provincial Park. Is there a potential for, like, a... Uh, private uh, public partnership there to bring those amenities to those facilities. Deputy Houston, 10 seconds. Uh, short answer is likely, and those are conversations that we will continue to have with NRR. Awesome. Okay, order. Uh, time has elapsed for liberal questioning. We'll now move on to the NDP, MLA LeBlanc. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, I just have a couple of sort of questions from your co from your opening comments and a couple of other things first, and then I'll I'll get back to the Auditor General uh, presentation. Um, but the first thing I want to say is um, I want to commend the department uh, on the decision to um, designate the Art Bank purchases to African Nova Scotian and BIPOC uh, artists this year. I think that's an uh, it was a very good idea, t one whose time has come. And I know I've seen on social media some uh, backlash, is that the right word? <laughs> backlash to that decision. Uh, and I, um, yeah, I just think uh, that's really super unfortunate that there's been some backlash, uh, but I think it's a great decision. I wanted to know, but mo moving forward, um, if there has been some, uh, Sort of thinking around, uh, as you know, af after this year, like, is there a, is there a way to designate a certain amount of money for BIPOC artists so that so that that you know that that equ equity continues on and then we don't get back to the situation where we have to you know um, sort of retract and you know and 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 do what we're doing this year. Deputy Houston, if I could, I'd like to ask Susan Jeffries to address that question. Ms. Jeffries. Thank you. Uh, I'm aware of the backlash. I certainly have, have uh, seen that. Uh, overwhelmingly, though, people were supportive of, of the idea of doing that this year to increase representation in the collection. Um, so I think this year will be interesting to see uh, you know, what comes forward and, and the art artworks that we are collecting. Uh, there would be absolutely no um, reason why we wouldn't consider uh, designating uh, future monies from the art bank uh, to that, but that would be something that we would look into following this year to see what kind of support we get from the community with this new idea of, of designating the collection. Emily LeBlanc. Great, thank you. Um, I also wanted to ask, so uh, in your opening comments, Deputy Houston, you talked about the seven point something, 7.1 million, uh, yeah, million <laughs> uh, dollar increase. Um, five, uh, five and change is go has gone to like professional arts organizations, cultural organizations, 2.1 million is for museums. I know that in the cultural sector, the art sector at least, um, that process of figuring out how to allocate that new uh, much asked for, uh, historically asked for money is still in process. And so I'm wondering if we could speak a little bit about where we are with museums. So if there's 2.1 million allocated to sort of operating museums, uh, has it, how has that money been dealt with? Is, uh, as, we, as we go into the coming up budget session, um, Will you know? Will it be a, a clear? Will will how that money's um, being spent be clearer in this upcoming budget? Deputy Houston, I'll I'll, I'll answer that generally, and then I'll I'll <laughs> hand it to Stephanie if there's more detail. If I yeah, if sure. I miss any key points. Um, yeah, no, it, it, I recognize. Um, I think that is a real. Um, uh, issue that you've identified, not necessarily in a in a bad way, but it is real that we are kind of going through that process. So um, it's helpful to understand that both in terms of some of the the arts and culture funding, but I think what you're referring to is some of the community museum uh, sites, which we are going to be actually just th probably next week. Money will be going out towards those organizations. So the key was is that we wanted to make sure that dollars flowed uh, this year. Um, but the challenge also is that, as folks in that sector would know, is that funding has been frozen for so long and that the number of sites has been frozen for so long. And what we wanted to do was make sure that we were putting out uh, money this fiscal, but that we have a process in place for uh, going forward that we're able to look at assessing current funding levels, 
maybe there's or maybe there's museums or sites that receive very little or none, but it's only because historically they weren't in the earlier batch. And so we want to kind of have a process where we're able to look a little bit more fairly and equally across. Um, but I'll hand it to Stephanie, actually, who can talk a little bit about what some of those percentages and why some receive more than others. Ms. Smith? <clears throat> Um, so the 2.1 is specifically for the Provincial Museum, our locally managed sites, and that money has been dispersed. Uh, we allot that in two allotments through the operating season. So that's been taken care of. On the Community Museum side, uh, that's where we've had a bit of a leg because of the process the deputy just mentioned. Uh, the good news is, is that um, the whole administrative side of that is being reviewed and reworked and we're really committed to getting funding to those sites out to them as early as possible you know so they can get up and running there because of lack of funding their uh, operating seasons have been shorter and so with this new funding if we get that to them at the start of the season they can hire their summer staff and we're very much aware of it and we're very committed to addressing it Emily LeBlanc and so is there a timeline on that? Um, and just be, quite, be part of that is, um, at, speaking of our, what we were just talking about with winter tourism and that kind of thing, are there, are there any sites that are being identified as getting more funding so that they can have longer seasons? Um, Ms. Smith? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, they were, um, because of their operating pressures that they were facing before they got their increase, they were mitigating that pressure by reducing their season length. So now that they've got more funding, they'll be able to have a longer season. But the vast majority of them are quite small operations and it's very difficult for them to be open in the winter, especially in rural Nova Scotia. But we do have larger sites. Uh, Ross Farms open, Highland Village is open. We have sites across the province that are able to do some winter programming. And it's great to have tourism in our department now because we work very closely with them. Um, updating a lot of uh, social media, um, the Compelling Tourism uh, Initiative has been really fantastic for the Black Loyalist Heritage uh, Center, for example, and Highland Village, and it's putting them in a much better sort of market-ready position to bring people in year-round. So we're really excited about that, and there's no question the funding increases have helped with that. Emily LeBlanc. Um, yeah, I still didn't hear about timeline. So I, I feel like I feel like since um, uh, MLA Leo Levine was minister, we've been talking about the review of community and museums, and that's a, several years. So I'm just wondering if we could, if we know when this will be completed, and we can go forward. Ms. Smith, uh, I think. Okay, Deputy Houston. Yeah. So 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 sorry, um, MLA. Um, and we weren't clear. So the funding for this fiscal should be flowing as early as next week. Um, and in terms of the, we are the review process. It's not. A, we're not talking about an overhaul of the CMAP system. This is around kind of the process, or just around how do we allocate fairly the the, <coughs> the additional funding that we received. And so that uh, that will be happening early in the fiscal year so that organization, the, the community museum sites will have that funding very early in the season so they can plan the season accordingly. Emily LeBlanc. Thanks. Um, two more quickies. Um, so 15% of visitors we know went to a museum or historic site uh, last year or um, do, how, do we track any revenues on that? So some, some, some of those museums and uh, historic sites charge uh, an entrance fee. Some uh, collect donations and, you know, a little glass box or whatever. Do we know uh, sort of what the uh, revenue is? And then the other question is in terms of um, those, again, those museums and historic sites. Do we know, uh, in terms of the funding Nova Scotia allots to them, do we have a per capita spend? So, you know, is it like $5 for every Nova Scotian that we put into museums or? Deputy Houston. On that last question, I'm not sure. I don't think we do. No. We don't have a per capita spend. But I would say, uh, I'll share with you some information. Hopefully this answers, uh, and we can certainly follow up if I think we can provide you some more detailed information in terms of the actual breakdowns. Um, but, you know, the there's a national organization, I think of, I can't remember the acronym, but it's National Museum Organization. And they look at essentially that for every dollar invested into a Canadian museum and historic site, it, it equates to about $4 
overall return in terms of GDP. So that's, you know, we're pretty, investing a dollar in in terms of whether it's maintenance or whether it's salary, uh, and that spinoff creates an additional uh, four dollars. Um, so that that in terms of the overall the overall impact, um, in terms of uh, sorry, remind me your your, your first question. Am or I your, Leblanc? Yeah. Um, <laughs> It was, oh yeah, do we, have we been tracking the revenues from museums and historic sites? Deputy Houston. Uh, yes, so we can provide you, that's the one I said, we can provide you with a breakdown of, particularly for the Nova Scotia museum sites that are directly managed, uh, we can provide you with, with a list of that. For the community museum sites, the 63 that are under our system, we have, those are run by community, so we wouldn't know exactly how much revenue they're bringing. They will report to us annually, and so we could have that, but we don't have that as readily available. Uh, I will say that one of the pieces that we look at, uh, particularly around revenue, is that there's a balance for us around uh, revenue so that we can reinvest back into the museum system, but also with affordability. So we know that museum sites uh, are a, it's a great source if anybody here has a young family, it's where you, like we've, a little plug, we've got the, a new dinosaur exhibit that's gonna be opening soon at the Museum of Natural History, so uh, that should be an exciting one, and we'll have re probably record numbers of attendance. But we also keep our attendance uh, quite reasonable and quite low relative to federal sites, for example. So I think I, if you look at the Immigration Museum, I think it's $15 for an adult to go visit that site, and I think if the Museum of Natural History is six, Six thirty. Six six dollars and thirty cents. And so, a part of this is keeping uh, keeping museums uh, affordable for all Nova Scotians. And with affordability right now as our probably biggest issue in the province, we we think that's very important. Emily LeBlanc. Thanks. Well, this is exactly my point. So I was I'm asking about these numbers because I would love to know if there's an analysis uh, that shows that it's worth making museums free. And, and I've said this before in various times, but uh, in terms of if we want people to come to our province, if we want people to get out and, and you know, there's like social value, but there's also uh, an economic value. I mean, I know that there are plenty of arts organizations across North America and UK that have have decided to make their entrance fee uh, free and the like the sort of revenues on you know merch sales and advertising and all of those other things have like boosted the budgets like it's you would never ex expect uh, but because of the amount of people coming through the doors because there's no cost uh, yeah they're it's economically really sound so I just was that's why I'm asking these questions I would love to know if there's an analysis being done last thing I want to ask about before I pass it over to my colleague is so in terms of heritage um, property designations and that kind of thing. This is a very specific question, but in Dartmouth North, there is a lot of land where they think, they who are the you know historians of Dartmouth, um, think that there is an, a historical African Nova Scotian church foundation. Um, but this is like this teeny weeny little place. It makes a, a lot of sense that this, church, that this is what this foundation that they found is. Uh, they're trying to figure out if it is uh, the historic church from that community, um, like d how do we protect it? How do we not develop that little parcel of land because there's development going on all around it? I'm wondering um, if the department weighs in on anything like that or how, like, how does that get decided or who figures it out? Seven minutes, Deputy Houston. Um, I'm, I'm going to hand that specific question to Susan Jeffries, but just in, in response to your earlier part around the analysis, mm -hmm. um, we have been looking at different models. Uh, I would say, and we have days that are free, for example, uh, and, uh, but I would also say that we've done some exit surveys or some surveys with people who are using the museum system. And what we're also saying, the cost hasn't been an issue, and in some cases, uh, people when something costs a little bit, it's like when you put something on Facebook Marketplace. If it's free, no one buys it. If it's 20 bucks on it or five bucks, people are like, oh, it's a deal. There's something about people putting a value on something where even if it's nominal, they, they see more value in it. And that's something that we've been seeing with some of our research and analysis. So I agree with you, affordability is absolutely key. I'm just not sure that in all cases, free admission. Now, I would also say that locally managed sites and some of the sites there's flexibility, and so some do things a little differently, and so we are able to learn 
um, how other folks are approaching it, and you know, every region's a little different, so we're seeing successes in different ways. So that's an answer to that question. And then I will hand it over to Susan Jeffries in regard to the, that question around historical property. Ms. Jeffries. I am vaguely familiar with that uh, that lot of land that came into our department um, from a concerned citizen, I want to say maybe a year and a half ago, about its uh, origins and some research was needed to determine um, what it is and what it isn't. Uh, I can get you some further details as to what we did uh, to assist with discovering that, um, but generally speaking, uh, for that sort of thing, whether it's a property or a, a piece of land, is we would work with the municipality to uh, understand what research might be available about the property and, and its ownership. So ultimately, to make a designation would be um, done by the owner of that property and they could uh, decide uh, whether they want to apply for municipal registration or provincial registration or both. So um, as my understanding with that particular property, the inquiry was made, but I, we haven't had any discussions since that initial inquiry, but I can find out if there's been any more traction on, on applying for that particular piece of property. Yeah. Um, so four and a half minutes, <coughs> MLA Lachance. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> uh, uh, pardon me. Uh, uh, so I'm actually going to stick to the issue of heritage properties, um, and I'm also going to try and fire off some questions in the brief time that I have. So, um, so one question I have was around um, the Heritage Properties Act and um, how the department. Um, reflects what it learns, what you learn um, in, in you know, providing support and that sort of thing into sort of policy making and thinking about the act and is it, is it, is the act um, still relevant? Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing in Nova Scotia? I certainly hear from lots of constituents who are concerned about our Provincial Heritage Act. Um, so I would be interested to know about that. Um, and you might not get there in the next couple of minutes, but um, then the other question I had was around some of the heritage property programs that the Auditor General had highlighted in their report um, and about sort of demand uptake on met need and whether the funding is adequate in those. Deputy Houston? Just, I'll, I'll let uh, Susan speak to some of the program specifics, but in terms of um, your question around the Heritage Property <laughs> Act, uh, we're not, there's no plans for us to kind of look at a review of that, of that act. Um, we, we do, we have worked, for example, the act seems to have worked well with the, I mean, the recent, it was reactive, but to the demolition of Reed House, and we had powers under that act which were exercised, and I think served as a deterrent for um, anybody who does not want to respect that act. Um, but I guess in short is that we aren't planning any kind of act review or policy review at this time. <coughs> Emily Lachance. Oh, sorry. Just, Ms. Jeffries, sorry. I'll just jump right in. Uh, so regarding program support, so we mentioned the Heritage Property Program, uh, which has a $200,000 budget. Um, we've had uh, uh, enough budget to meet the demand of that program uh, this year. Um, there's two ways, uh, or two um, parts of that program. One part of it is uh, an applicant can come in and ask for support for conservation advice. So that would be uh, a property owner who uh, maybe has some structural concerns and wants to work with um, a professional to find out how they can repair or uh, address that issue. The other part of the program Order. that we support... Uh, I'm just having a signal here from uh, Emily Lachance, who, who I think would like to ask a question. Emily Lachance? I might just, uh, pardon me, I might just sneak in another question. I do have a description of the two types of programs in the Auditor General's presentation. Um, and I'm wondering if those current amounts, though, the up to $10,000 over 10 years and the up to 5000 for the conservation advice grants, are those still felt to be adequate ceilings? Ms. Jeffries. They are. Um, keeping in mind, we only pay for a portion of the work that comes in for application. Um, so to date, that has been adequate. Certainly on the conservation advice side, $5,000 is, is deemed to be, you know, a requisite amount for the kind of work that they might need to do. Um, so the projects that come in, we do just pay a contribution of that $10,000. Uh, you know, we do understand construction costs are, are rising, um, but to date we've been able to uh, meet the demand through that cap that we have on the program. Emily Lachance? One minute. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, so I, maybe I'll just foreshadow a question for the next period of time. And um, so I, I mean, you mentioned uh, you know expanding different sites and, and working with different communities in, in all sorts of ways throughout the the, the department. Um, and my colleague uh, MLA LeBlanc talked about even with the art bank like making a designated acquisition so I'm wondering um, what what capacity and and how the department undertakes sort of a general scan of uh, Nova Scotian communities and how communities are changing and you know what to be saved what to be highlighted what becomes our heritage um, uh, and in particular, I think I'd just reflect that, you know, at a time there was actually some pretty solid order. T uh, time for NDP questioning has currently elapsed. We'll come back, um, and now we'll move on to P the PC Caucus, MLA <coughs> Barkhouse. Thank you, Chair. Um, and you mentioned this early earlier that there's, you know, there was a freeze on operations, increasing. Um, the government increased operations for arts, culture, and heritage organizations. What impacts are are you seeing for this sector? Uh, Deputy Houston. Uh, thanks for that question. That's a, that's a great question. So. Um, I, th I think one of the things, oh, there's a few things that we're seeing that are very positive. So um, part of this is, um, you know, these, these sites located across Nova Scotia are cultural hubs uh, for, for the regions. And they anchor a lot of other activities, businesses um, uh, in those areas. And so um, Part of this was around, and again, one of the emphasis was around salary increases, and, and those weren't didn't keep pace with with other salary increases or inflation, and so re staff attraction and retention has been key. So you know you've got a specialist that's a museum specialist that is, um, you know, in in rural Nova Scotia, uh, they are going to be. <clears throat> possibly attracted away from that for another job so we people are able to retain those specialist positions uh, so that's one the other one is around the ability to think about when they're able to make ends meet or in the in the on season they can look at can we extend by two weeks can we extend by a month uh, and remain open longer. The other is around looking at ways to modernize um, interpretation. So that's both in terms of quality as well as content, uh, speaking to issues that MLA Lachance uh, started to raise. So we've seen a very positive, um, uh, but what's really going to be, I think, interesting to see the next couple of years because uh, these locations and these sites just received the funding, and I think they're able to start planning now strategically about how are things going to be different, and that's what we're looking forward to seeing. Uh, Emily Barkhouse, I, I agree with that 100%. That it's going to take you know a year or two to see, and also that um, some of these museums are hubs. For example, the New Ross Farm is a hub for the community, and if anybody is looking for something to do, February 3rd and 4th is Winter Frolic. So, I mean, they're open all year round. <laughs> homemade ice cream, you know, stuff like that, snowshoeing. Um, so, no, I, I, they are. It's a beautiful museum. Um, so, how is Nova Scotia museums increasing? accessibility and um, inclusion. Uh, Deputy Houston, 17 uh, minutes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to hand this one over to uh, Stephanie Smith. I think she can speak with the most detail to this. Ms. Smith? Thank you. Um, so under the Accessibility Act, the Nova Scotia Museum is a prescribed public sector body. So uh, that means that we have to have an overall accessibility plan for all 28 sites. And I'm really pleased to be able to say that we do now have that plan. It's on our website. And in order to uh, make that a reality, staff worked with representatives from museums across the province and um, the disabled community and organizations representing people with disabilities. So we have that plan in place and it outlines accessibility in a very broad sense. Everything from the physical accessibility to the online experience to interacting with the collection and the programs that are offered, even how um, accessible our sites are via public transportation, for example. Um, so now the next phase is for, uh, we continue to work with the Accessibility Directorate and Halifax staff are working closely with Ross Farm staff and other uh, rural staff so that they can have site-specific plans uh, developed. 
Emily Barkos. Excellent, thank you. Um, so another question, how is Nova Scotia Museums incorporate, incorporating planning for uh, climate change um, into the operations and programs? And, and you know, I have Peggy, Peggy's Cove is in my constituency and that is, is uh, definitely an uh, area that might be hit or could, is going to be hit maybe. Um, so I'm just wondering what you guys are doing to incorporate that. Deputy Houston. Great, Thank, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I will hand it over to, to Stephanie here in a second, but I, I would say is that our department is taking climate change adaptation very seriously. As someone, uh, you know, as a department that manages, <clears throat> uh, you know, I think 240 provincial assets across the province, uh, many of which are located in small towns along the coast, we know the impacts of storms like Fiona. Uh, that have resulted in closure or need for major repair. And so a part of our work is, uh, is, is sort of disaster planning, but it is also how we make repairs and how we build to ensure that we're ready for the next 50, 100 year storm. Uh, and there are processes that we have in place. We're one of the leading departments working with the Department of Environment and Climate Change around climate adaptation planning. And I'll let Stephanie speak to that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Ms. Smith? Uh, thank you. Um, so we've been working on this for quite some time now. Um, I think it was about 10 years ago that the Fisheries Museum was um, had a major stabilization project uh, take place where basically lifted that old uh, fish factory uh, higher up off the wharf and put in new pilings. And this is all to uh, deal with rising sea level. Uh, Ross Farm is now geothermal uh, energy supported. Um, a brand new facility at Highland Village, the Welcome Center that they built there um, is uh, passive, uh, I'm not sure what that is, solar. passive solar. It, it meets actually a very high standard of what we used to call LEED <coughs> standard. It's now passive house, I think they call it. So all of these preventive measures, uh, Public Works has been extremely supportive in helping us get there. And um, that puts us in a much better position to deal with climate change. So as the deputy says, we have a strategic um, uh, plan uh, that we're working with our sites, uh, developing emergency response and um, disaster plans to be proactive. Um, and we really are so fortunate because we're embedded in rural communities. And so for example, when the wildfires happened, how can you plan for that? Uh, and we were actually able to get some artifacts out of the Black Loyalist Heritage Center, uh, triaging with local people to get some of the artifacts safe to Halifax. So there's some things that we benefit from those really close working relationships and other things are more longer term um, uh, infrastructure based uh, initiatives. And just finally, another thing that might not be top of mind is the education role that museums play with respect to climate change. So up at the Museum of uh, Natural History, we have exhibits there about that. We're working closely with archeologists, uh, looking at um, archeology span sites at risk in coastal areas. That's a huge concern for rural communities. Um, so a lot of work is happening on many different fronts. Emily Burkhouse. Hi. I truly appreciate that response, and um, I I, I know about New Ross Farm, of course, because it's it's one of our pride and joys, and and um, so I, I thank you. But I'm going to leave time for my colleagues and pass it over to MLA Taggart. MLA Taggart. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, thanks for being here, folks. I just uh, I I'm, I'm so I'm trying I'm I'm want to make sure I understand things right. But where I'm really going with this uh, is the uh, difference between operational funding for uh, uh, community museums and provincial mu museums. But first, I want to make sure I understand it right. So provincial museums are the operation of provincial museums are fully funded by uh, culture, heritage, and recreation. Right? Is that correct? Deputy Houston? Yeah, so, so it's, it's a good question and it's helpful because it is, it is, our system is somewhat complex and I kind of spoke to that in my opening remarks. So we have a number of sites, uh, 28. We have 28. We have 28 sites uh, that are part of the Nova Scotia Family Museum. How many of those are directly managed? 11 are government owned and operated. 
And then the remaining are government assets, so the provincial assets, but they are managed by a local organization. So Ross Farm would be a great example of that. That is a provincial asset, but it is managed by a local organization or society. Then in addition to that, there are what we call the community uh, community museum sites. So those are, there are 63 in our system, and that funding, the, only a portion of their funding or their operating comes from the province. And those are typically smaller sites and those are all run by community. Those are community assets or they're private. Uh, they are not owned uh, by the province. So there is a bit of a difference between the different sites across this. And we have probably more museums uh, in our system than any other jurisdiction, I would say, definitely in Canada, but probably in North America. Emily Taggart, 10 okay. minutes. If I could just say, I'm glad we do. I think s certainly we have really rich, rich heritage here and, uh, you know, uh, still have a big story to tell, really. Uh, so, but, so, the, uh, I, I believe I heard that the 2.1 million that we, you spoke of earlier for provincial funding was strictly for those uh, particular provincially owned or, or managed 28, right? Deputy, uh, Deputy uh, Houston. Those are for the 17. Yeah. Um, Emily Taggart. Thanks. And so what uh, sort of, uh, can you give me an idea of ballpark of, and I'm sure that when we talk about the other, whatever it is, 68 or whatever museums around Nova Scotia, there's difference in magnitude, you know, size and, and visitors and all that sort of thing. But what kind of funding do we provide to them in terms of operating funding? Um, yeah, and, and I'll be frank, you know, I, I think that I, I, I'd like to see more of that. I guess that's where I'm going with this. I think, uh, um, and I understand, don't get me wrong, I'm not being critical. I understand challenges, the challenges uh, with the uh, funding and that sort of thing. Deputy Houston, nine minutes. Uh, thank you for the question. I'm going to hand it to Susan Jeffries, who will give you an example of some of the funding that we provide to the locally, uh, the community museum sites. Ms. Jeffries. Thank you. Um, so at the time that we received our, our budget increase for museums, where there was a set aside amount for community museums, and that was $650,000. Uh, that is in addition to the current operating funding that the 63 museums received through my division, but now going to AML uh, for next fiscal. That was approximately uh, almost shy of a million dollars. So collect okay. almost shy of a million dollars, 900, uh, I want to say 946,000. Collectively with the increase, we're at about 1.5 million in support just for community museums. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, uh, your question also, I think, was asking about the, the various types, uh, amounts of funding, if I believe. Emily Tiger. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly interested in operating funding. And, and, and I gotta tell you, so one of the challenges there is that a lot of these museums, and uh, one I'm thinking of in particular is an outstanding museum in, in Tatamagush, uh, uh, Logan Frazier. I, anyway, I, I don't have the right name, so I won't get into that. But, um, but yeah, yeah, they are, uh, typically run by uh, community residents, and those community residents are aging. And it's more and more difficult all the time uh, for them to, uh, to to do the work that's required. So operating is becoming a challenge. And so uh, I, I really w want to be specific on uh, on how much money uh, the, uh, goes to actual operating. I know there's different, you know, little pots here and there for this repair and that, you know, those kind of things, but w w where are we at? What, how much money into operating them, or in, if there is any? Ms. In Jeffries. the app, yeah. Oh. Emily Houston, uh, uh, Deputy yeah. Houston, yeah. nice pay cut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's right. Uh, well, no, it's it's a good question, and unfortunately, I don't have. It, it's a difficult one to pin down because the it really depends on um, on the site itself and the kind of the complexity around that. So, for example, certain sites may be open. Um, only on weekends, others open all summer long, others just short periods of time. Uh, some may have a, a building or a large facility that needs to be maintained. Others have programming that, uh, that they run through. And so on, on average, we, we provide a, 
a, I would say a relatively small portion of their overall <clears throat> budget or expenditures. And we've looked to increase that in many cases, doubling that uh, we've been able to over the last funding. But again, as I, as I said, we're, we are going to be getting that funding out very shortly to those groups. And we will be working with them, talking with them as we start to develop our process for the new funding formula to make sure that uh, we are helping to meet their needs. But I want to be clear that the, the CMAP program was never intended to fund these museum sites fully. It was always as a way to augment or support a local group so that they could then, and part of the work that we are looking at doing, we do now, but we're looking to also expand is around how can we work with some sites that are well positioned or are interested as local groups in terms of diversifying their revenue streams and looking at ways that they can uh, bring revenue in. So for example, um, maybe there are sites that could be, uh, that folks are excited about renting for weddings. Uh, maybe there are others where it could be used as a retreat for uh, businesses and organizations that might want to get away to do strategic planning. Uh, so those are examples. Some might be well suited to turn into a, a vacation rental for on a weekend and stay in a lighthouse. I'm just I'm making that up. I don't know, but there um, it could be. There are, there are opportunities I think out there, and there is certainly we know from our from working with our tourism colleagues that authentic experiences is what people want, and so you can't get much more authentic than staying in a historical property or visiting one. And so I think there are ways that look at. I think for a long time we we haven't always placed the value on these sites, and so there, I think there's an opportunity, whether it's through charging admission or like these experience things. So we're very excited to work with some of these sites, but to your point, um, there's also I think an opportunity to engage some of the younger generation in how this, and it's a win-win, because if we can look at capitalizing on their understanding and knowledge of what people are interested in experiencing, I think that can help transform some of these locations as well. Emily Taggart. Thanks, and I'm, I'm just I'm going to hand it over to my colleague uh, Melissa there. I just, but anyway, yeah, I I, I think I have a special museum, and I, you know I think I know everybody thinks that, and uh, uh, so you folks will certainly be hearing through Courtney, I guess, from us. But uh, yeah, thanks. Four minutes, Emily Sheehy Richard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Really interesting, uh, important subject, I think, uh, trying to make sure that we preserve this heritage in our communities, and I think we're all really passionate about it and excited to see, I think you said the 7.6 million too with the increase. I'm just wondering, like you hear often that departments do jurisdictional scans, uh, if you could speak a little bit about how um, the Nova Scotia Museum uh, model compares what we have here to other jurisdictions in Canada. Deputy Houston? I'll start out with a high-level response, and then I'll, I'll ask Stephanie to fill, fill in the blanks. But um, I, I think what uh, uh, the short answer is that Nova Scotia, one of the things that makes, I think, Nova Scotia unique or special is one is a sort of our decentralized and family approach to the museum system. So in some jurisdictions, and Stephanie can tell you which ones, they have a single provincial museum that is typically in their capital city and... Um, that's where everything is and that's where everybody needs to go. Um, starting in the 60s and 70s, um, Nova Scotia really adopted a different approach where we saw the value of the different assets across the province and we looked at having a more distributed approach. And I think some other jurisdictions are doing that too and Stephanie can, can speak to that a little bit. Um, but uh, certainly as I mentioned earlier, I think we have one of the largest numbers of museum sites that we support, which is great in terms of for visitors and for locals alike. Ms. Smith? Thank you. Um, so yes, so most um, provinces would have a standalone provincial museum that's usually a Crown Corp uh, model. And um, with a staff, a CEO answering to a board, and um, it, you find in the Maritimes, uh, well, in Newfoundland and in Prince Edward Island, a more, a similar uh, setup to what we have here in Nova Scotia. Um, so in the 70s, you had a museum boom. You had all these sites joining, and then things kind of petered out in the 80s. Chant House was the last one. Um, and then there was a hiatus. And in 2000, we brought in um, Acadian Village and Highland Village. And then in 2016, the Black Loyalist Heritage Center. So those last three were... Um, initiatives to really uh, address what what was lacking in cultural diversity in the system, 
and I've had the privilege to work in the system, you know, for a couple of decades, and I really see the ability to have these sites embedded in communities is um, a real strength of the system, because, uh, you know, for what you were discussing earlier, um, <coughs> to be able to work together with government staff in Halifax and um, work on these major projects like new buildings and new programs and extending the tourist season, you know, we're stronger together. And I do find that if you look at some of our government operated sites in, in the rural areas, they're a little more isolated because they don't have that local board and that group of volunteers working with us. Mm -hmm. So it's a very strong model in a lot of aspects. 30 seconds, Emily Sheehy Richard. Uh, I guess I was, I'll have to wait for round two because I was just going to kind of, I think you touched on them, but like there would be challenges and strengths uh, associated with, with it, I, I assume. So I don't know if you have anything to add in 10 seconds. <laughs> Deputy Houston? More to come on that in the next <laughs> round of questions. Okay, so we'll now move over to the uh, second round of questioning. Um, today, everyone gets 14 minutes. Woohoo! So we will begin with uh, Emily uh, McGuire. You have till 1021. The one time I don't have 14 minutes worth of questions. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> you want some nine? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I just I want to get back to uh, uh, really taking advantage of our sites across Nova Scotia. Uh, and one of the things you talked about was <laughs> facilities on site. And, um, you know, in order to... I'm assuming, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like maybe talked about a pilot project or looking at certain areas where we can open them up during the winter time, but obviously everybody wants uh, uh, the the park or, or the museum and, or the historical land or site uh, in their area opened up during the winter, um, but you need uh, the facilities on site. So I want to touch on that a bit because we did run into some things and I know it's not you but I think there there has to be some collaboration between departments. So this year we had a young lady come from BC back home to Sambro uh, and she wanted to open up um, something at Crystal Crescent for food and drinks and different things like that and she went down there opened up she had a, a trailer and you can just imagine uh, you know within a couple of days uh, enforcement was there and and they told her she had to leave. And there was this whole process, and we were going back and forth. Uh, and I can honestly say that uh, they dragged their feet like I've never seen before. And unfortunately, right toward the end of the year, they told her that she couldn't get a permit. Um, and so we've run into this, in particular, I use Crystal Crescent, we've run into this over and over and over with Crystal Crescent Beach. Um, and so if we want to be able to, uh, for tourism, culture, and heritage, uh, if we want to be able to bring people in, and for those that don't know, like Crystal Crescent isn't just a beach, you know, we have the lighthouse here, the oldest uh, operating lighthouse in the North America. There's all kinds of different things. There's the trails and all these things, but we don't have any facilities there, and it's so hard. It's like pulling teeth. So I think there has to be a plan in place. Uh, because I do think that I don't think it's just my community. I think there's other communities where I think it's it's a bit unfair that some of these areas are going to be, uh, you know, potentially looked at for year round. Um, because of the facilities and the investments that was made by this current government and past governments. And then we have Crystal Crescent Beach and Long Lake, Provin and I'll tell you the story around Long Lake Provincial Park. Uh, but. Um, but because we didn't have those facilities there, we can't get those. So is there a plan in place to kind of look at what we have and maybe turn some of these beaches um, into like a Lawrencetown beach where they have facilities on site and make it easier for P3 and private partnerships on these, on these properties? Deputy Houston. Uh, th thanks for raising the uh, the question, the issues. As you start out with, like, it isn't re this isn't my department, obviously, so I can't speak in detail. And this is something, certainly, my colleagues at Natural Resources and Renewables uh, could speak to in more detail. I can tell you, though, uh, I will spend a little bit of time talking about, you know, the part of the extending the season and having um, experiences like being able to access a park. Um, it, in the, the cases where we're looking at it is not necessarily around facilities at the at say like a Crystal Crescent. Um, it is ensuring it would be ensuring that folks can park, 
they might you know might have trash that they can throw their their dog waste there or something but it's also you know if let's say a, a great example would be um somerville beach right you've got the quarter deck there you've got white point up the road um and you know it's something that you know, everybody, I think locals know, you can use the beach in the winter, but if you're visiting and you're off season and you see a gate closed and you're not from the area, you don't know that you can actually walk through there and it's, yeah. it's there for maintenance. And so a part of this is how do we make some of those areas more welcoming uh, and more accessible? But of course that does not come without resources required, even, if, even minimal. Uh, and so those are conversations that we need to have with our colleagues at NRR. Can I just touch on something? Emily McGuire. I do want to touch on something right quick. Uh, you talked about like trash re removal and things like that. Uh, so when I, when I first got elected in 2013, no. uh, one of the things I always said about our, my community, the community that I'm from, um, is that there's literally everything five, ten minutes away from downtown Halifax. And we've been able to partnership with the group to create the McIntosh Run Trail System. We've been able to partner with uh, individuals to create those trails at Long Lake Provincial Park, which was like pulling teeth, uh, to be frank with you. Um, and for those that don't know, like Long Lake Provincial Park is not and has not um, had uh, management by government. It's managed by a volunteer <laughs> board, which fundraises. Uh, we have the, uh, so we have lakes, we have the ocean, we have beaches, we have trail systems. But when you talk about amenities and facilities, I'll give you a good example, another area you're familiar with, the Look Off in Heron Cove. Mm -hmm. Uh, we put trash cans there, and uh, w the great couple that lives down there, I don't know if you know who they are, but uh, Patty and Peter LaPierre were emptying the garbage, voluntarily emptying the garbage, because uh, the department would put the garbage cans there, but they wouldn't empty them, right? So then it became a bit of a burden. They're an older couple, if they're listening, they're probably not listening, but they're an older couple, but people were putting TVs and different things there. But here is, lies the problem. Again, we go into this, these things where we're like, we need these garbage, garbage removal. We, you know, Crystal Crescent Beach, for example, we need bathrooms and things like that, the bathrooms are there. But you know, what I've run into, and I know it's not your department, but it's, it, I think that what we do need is like uh, an overarching plan for our sites and for our tourism to say, okay, if we're gonna put garbage cans there, we should at least empty them. So what I was told when we put the garbage cans there that we'll put garbage cans there, but we're not emptying them, but you gotta get HRM to come in and empty the garbage cans. So I call up HRM and they're like, we're not emptying the garbage cans. There's not supposed to be garbage cans there. So I think, what I'm hoping is when we think of tourism and we think of culture and we think of attracting people, we, a lot of times we think of rural Nova Scotia and rightfully so, some of the most beautiful places on earth. But we've got some really good spots in HRM and what we do is we run up against city council and we run up against HRM and we run up against councillors and we run up against levels of government. So when it comes to tourism, I'm wondering if there is a plan for collaboration so that we don't have Peter and Patty down there emptying the garbage cans because the city doesn't want to do it because they said that the province should have never put garbage cans on a provincial site. Seven minutes, Deputy Houston. Uh, no, good, good issue identification, good questions. It, you know, collaboration across is key on any of this stuff. And, um, you know, I think some of the challenge you're facing, interjurisdictional stuff, it's like it's what drives your average citizen crazy. Um, and it is certainly one of the, the things that we see. Co collaboration is particularly important when we, we talk about things like trying to extend the season. Because as I mentioned earlier, it, it's a bit of a puzzle to make sure things fit. So, you know, we, we want someone to come here and, and come in November, but we certainly don't want them to come and have a terrible experience, put up a review on Google or Yelp, and then that's counterproductive to what we're trying to achieve. So the key is as we do some of these initiatives is how do we sit down with the right partners, make sure that we get it right so visitors and locals alike have the best experience possible. Um, you know, one of the things that was underway right now is that we are currently uh, underway with public engagement around uh, the development of a new tourism strategy. Uh, and the things that we've been talking about, season extension, um, <coughs> winter, diversity, uh, how do we access the assets that we have, rural and uh, in the city, are all a part of that conversation. So that's happening right now. Emily McGuire. So I will do... Uh, 
I will throw a compliment on the record where, where, where I will say that we we have a premier now who has said that he wants to get things done. He's going to go ahead and get things done, and and that's been his mo, and that's been my experience watching this government is that they're just you know they're going to get it done. And so I think this is something where again it's frustrating to. Um, individuals because we can't have a garbage can so now there's garbage everywhere because we can't get this collaboration so I do think that it's important that if we're going to continue and 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 come out of COVID and we're going to come out stronger that we've actually got to get past these petty jurisdictional stuff and and that's what we have a lot in HRM I don't know what it's like in the other places um, but also like start looking outside the box a little bit and looking at P3s and looking at working with the private sector. The one thing I think we're going to run into, and I don't know if your department is looking into this or addressing this yet, is uh, again, I'll use my, from my own personal experience, Long Lake Provincial Park and, and the lighthouse down in Sambro, that was all done from volunteers, right? The investment uh, came from Peter McKay at the time, but it was done by a group of volunteers that we got together and in, in, at the time, the Conservative government. and. Long Lake Provincial Park was done under the former McNeil government, but it's a group of uh, individuals that are getting older, right? The truth is, is a lot of these volunteers that are sitting on these boards are getting older. And it's the Marjorie and Martin Willison who have been volunteering for 60 years now that are saying, we want to pass this on, but we can't. So I think, I don't know if the department's looking into these things, and the same with museum boards, the same with all these things. It may, it's not as pressing as healthcare, we know that. It's not as pressing as some of the other issues out there. But I feel like this is a, um, about to fall apart. I think a lot of these volunteers are about to go away and where you don't have people stepping up to do it. So are you looking at maybe incentivizing or talking or figuring out a way that, uh, you know, well, like Provincial Park Board is teetering? Um, museum boards, the, the Urban Farm in Nova Scotia, luckily they have an influx of new people. Uh, but that urban farm, sorry, of Spryfield, uh, that is was teetering. So what do we do? Deputy Houston, three minutes. Uh, I mean, I, I think the issue of volunteer burnout uh, is certainly not unique to, to this sector, whether it's museums or tourism. Uh, and it's something that, you know, we, we have various funding programs through CCTH, the different organizations access around um, capacity uh, building and supports within organizations, volunteer organizations. Um, specific to museums um, is that we, you know, we've done some pretty uh, good work, I would say. I think we're leading uh, jurisdiction and some of this work around EDI work that we're doing with board training for museums. So this is something that we developed with the Board of Governors, with the Museum of Natural History, or the museum system. Uh, and uh, it's something that we have are making available now across the system. And so why I wanted to bring emphasis to that is that um, a part of this is how do we attract all Nova Scotians to participate and be active in um, these volunteer organizations? Because without a doubt, we need we need communities we need volunteers to be engaged and driving this for a lot of reasons you know it's not just resources that they know their communities best they're in touch with what's happening on the ground and they know their areas best and what's important uh, but we also want to make sure that um, it reflects the people who are in those communities so you know MLA McGuire, your your community has changed significantly over the past 30 years in terms of who is there. We want to make sure all residents feel like they're a part of the solution. And so a part of that is making sure that they see themselves reflected in the work that's happening and, and on the people that sit on those boards. Emily McGuire. One and a half. Yeah, I just want to thank you for your work. I know it's not easy, and it's uh, you know, uh, it's one of those departments that sometimes might fly under the radar to some of the bigger, you know, uh, transportation, health, education, things like that. But you know, just my um, eleven years or so in in doing this role, um, you come to realize how important the department is, and how many um, people and organizations and uh, places in Nova Scotia depend on the hard work that you do. And I can honestly say that uh, I've never had a negative experience with your department. I've always had um, positive outcomes and it's always, I shouldn't say all positive outcomes, even when things couldn't be done, um, the department's always been straightforward. So I do appreciate that. And I just want to say that there's a lot of great people working in that department and a lot of people depend on your department. So thank you for all your hard work. Emily Houston, or Emily. 
Deputy Minister Houston, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah. No, listen, listen, I, I certainly appreciate those, word, those words of support. I, I ag would agree. I think we have a fantastic department. The staff there are second to none. Uh, and I think what, what makes them so effective is that they're uh, work directly with community, they listen to community, and like you said, whether it's positive or it's maybe not positive news, is we're, we're all working together for the same thing, which is a better Nova Scotia, so I really appreciate those Order. comments. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to the NDP caucus for questioning. Emily Lachance. Thank you. 14 minutes. Okay. Um, so I might just um, actually continue on the compliment and then kind of restate uh, our my discussion from earlier um, and then that'll be 13 and a half minutes so I'm just kidding <laughs> um, so I mean so really my question comes from um, uh, feeling similar to MLA McGuire in terms of you know working with different community groups over the years and really having uh, excellent interactions with the folks um, at CCTH around uh, funding for community organizations and uh, people really thinking outside the box, um, uh, really feeling like people understood, uh, like staff understood the uniqueness of community-based organizations and about what they were trying to do. So, and and so so and so for that reason. Um, I, you know, when I worked in government, I felt it was particularly important, like there was a manager of LGBTQ plus issues at the time. Um, and in, in particular, I felt that was really significant because um, that, you know, on one hand, the department is saying we're a safe space, we've got someone who knows about your community, they probably don't know everything, but you can come in and, and we can, you know, find a, a path forward. Um, and I think that's really important on the museum and heritage and tourism side as well. So I guess I'm just wondering, in terms of your EDIA work, um, what expertise do you have within the department to do that work? Deputy Houston. Uh, thank, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I would say uh, I really appreciate being able to talk about this a little bit because I think CCTH across the system uh, is seen as a leader in this regard and has really been working to pilot and, and take different approaches and then uh, also take that opportunity to share with our, our colleagues across different departments. So, um, you know, as specific as like we have a, we have a, a position that is designated just focused on EDI uh, as part of our, our management team uh, and that's, their, that's her primary focus. That's, uh, that's what Aja Joshi does uh, and we have different staff. For example, we recently hired a Mi'kmaq culturally is an officer who from Eskasoni lives in Millbrook and is very tied into community and is to serve as that liaison and that portal into all our different programs um, uh, that we provide uh, to, to better connect with the community. Um, some of the work that we've been doing, you know, obviously we have uh, ANSA is a, is a part of our um, African Nova Scotian Affairs is a part of the department as well as Acadian Affairs and Gaelic Affairs. Uh, and so there's, there's pieces that we're doing there. I would also say um, that we have done an overhaul of our, and I've talked about this in previous committee presentations, an overhaul of our grants and funding programs uh, where we essentially have embedded EDI from the ground level all the way through. It, it took us a number of, COVID slowed us down, but it took us a couple of years, but working directly with First Voice, both in the department and in community to help shape not only uh, the programs that exist, but what programs may, we might want to focus on. Another key aspect is, you know, we wanted to make sure we were hearing from those organizations groups that weren't regularly talking with us because maybe they should be. And why aren't they, or why aren't we tapped into and in working with those groups? So. Um, so I think we're doing a lot of great work. I know that's kind of a high level response. I, I would like to take a second to plug that part of the work coming out of uh, our work around um, making our grants and programs more accessible, both in terms of to different uh, communities, but just in terms of your average Nova Scotian using is that we've developed and we're gonna be launching it in the coming weeks, a grant finder tool. And that will be of, of great interest to all MLAs uh, and all Nova Scotians, for those that are taking their time to watch Ledge TV. Uh, you will be able to go onto our website and using a simple search engine, you'll be able to uh, ask, a, you know, it will lead you through a series of questions. So one of the things that we heard back from, from folks was, 
I don't even know which door to open to, to go talk to. And, and if you're not connected in with folks that are already working in community, like you mentioned, we have good in reach into community, but some people go and they say, I don't, I know I want to hold this event, but I don't know. So this will walk you through and there will never be a closed door. Even if something doesn't quite fit, there will be an access to a number or an email that people can access. So we're, we're hoping that we'll, our grants and programs will be even more accessible than they are now. Emily Lachance. And um, before I hand it uh, over to my colleague, Emily LeBlanc, I just also, I mean, I did want to, I guess, uh, <coughs> start plugging on the heritage side, um, you know, I guess, continued assessment of, of where are our gaps in, in the heritage of our, of our province that we're recognizing. Obviously, my expertise is more along the lines of two SLGBTQIA plus communities, but I, I, I think there are other communities that are, you know, more and more important in our <coughs> province, and we we don't have, uh, we don't know their history, um, and uh, so I think that's really important, um, and as well in terms of like pride tours, and this is something that I've like tried to plug <laughs> many times before. But you know, I honestly we have these like amazing uh, prides, all o celebrations all over the province, like next to the ocean. I mean. Folks, this is like a gold mine mm -hmm. waiting to be explored, um, and you know, and I think, uh, you know, somehow bringing that together, figuring what the target markets are, uh, you know, walking people through what a couple of weeks could look like in the province, um, and then also, you know, working with tourism and providers so that they're able to show that they're you know, safe spaces, which I think is also really important. Um, and I've had similar conversations with folks who are interested in um, African Nova Scotian history and would love the added benefit of knowing, you know, where they were going to stay, for instance, was, uh, you know, uh, uh, a good environment, um, and I, you know, so I can see that for other communities as well. So I'll, I will leave it at that, um, and hand it over to my colleague. So just over seven minutes, Emily LeBlanc. Thanks, and uh, yeah. Yes to all of that. Uh, my constituency assistant actually uh, is a writer and uh, published a really amazing book about the queer community and like in this very specific time period of like late 80s, uh, early 90s in Halifax. And it's like a fascinating read. And she's then since done, you know, walking tours of queer sites and queer historical sites in Halifax for various groups that come in. And so that kind of stuff is like, it is a gold mine. And, and it's a, it's a, it's wonderful for both Nova Scotians who already are here and, and also visitors and newcomers. Um, I wanted to ask about Cape Breton for a second. Uh, so I have, um, you know, received email and um, different correspondence over the years about Cape Breton and, and also looked at a little bit about, you know, in terms of grant uh, programs um, in certain areas, there is a, a much smaller um, uh, success rate, and I'm assuming that's because it's a much smaller application rate from, uh, uh, in particular, arts organizations and cultural organizations in Cape Breton. And I understand that there are like staff tours that go up, and you know, but I'm wondering if there's been any sort of more thought to sort of a Cape Breton arts and culture strategy, or if that, that exists. Um, and same thing with a African Nova Scotian cultural strategy. Uh, I know that there was talk of that happening. Just want to know if there's an update on, on that and particularly the Cape Breton part. Five and a half minutes, Deputy Houston. Uh, on, on, the, um, on the arts and maybe the arts and culture or grant programs into Cape Breton, no, there isn't a specific plan to look at that specifically, but um, we, do, we do work with a lot of the key organizations that are there and our staff are very tied in both regional and here in Halifax, tied into kind of what they're seeing on the ground. Uh, I can tell you that for for some of this, I know there's sometimes a perception in terms of the percentage of funding that goes to there, is that in some cases, um, you know, whether it's arm's length, like Arts Nova Scotia or their staff review, like we have criteria and ranking that go through, and sometimes it is based on just 
you know, the number of applications that come in. Uh, and um, we do look at that closely. So if you're ever curious around specific questions, I know we've asked, been asked questions in the past from MLA Coombs, for example, we provided that detail. But we can provide you with a breakdown of where those are going. But um, on your second questions uh, around African Nova Scotia and cultural strategy, um, not, not specifically, uh, we are we are working on a um, part of our mandate letter is around the African Nova Scotian tourism strategy. So that work is starting to happen with tourism and African Nova Scotian affairs. I will say though that there has been a significant increase in funding towards African Nova Scotian cultural organizations. Uh, the African Nova Scotian Music Association got a sizable increase uh, this past year. Uh, Africville um, Museum Society as well. So those are some examples where we certainly do see the value. Um, and I will also note that, um, you know, not unlike working with the Mi'kmaq, is it's very important for those the stories, and it to be coming from that first voice. So, um, you know, and, and that doesn't mean just working with staff internally. That is working with those organizations in community to see what are their priorities. And so we're trying to be as responsive as possible to those. Emily LeBlanc. Thanks. I also wanted to get an update on the soundstage. Uh, is I mean, I, I know that the soundstage is funded through. I mean, I'm pretty sure it is through CCTH. Um, and I, but I do know that it's sort of being handled by Screen Nova Scotia. Um, wondering um, about the wetland it's being built on, for instance. Uh, wondering if there's if there's any sort of conversations between departments on that. Um, it looks like, to me, it looks like, a, aside from the fact that there's a giant wetland, uh, a great location for the soundstage. Uh, but uh, yeah, any comments on that particularly? Three, three minutes, Deputy Houston. I, I don't have specific information there, although I do know that in some of those early discussions, I do know that they are very aware of that site in terms of what's the, the restrictions there relative to wetlands. So I think, um, you know, Screen Nova Scotia would be the appropriate organization to talk to for that update, but I know they are aware of that and they're planning around that in terms of their future build. Uh, it will take all that into account. Emily LeBlanc. Great, and just for the record, um, I've put winter frolic into my calendar for this weekend. <coughs> I'm uh, pretty excited to go snowshoeing. Um, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm wondering about, so um, you may have already said this, and, I've, and forgive me if you've given this number, but the amount of annual funding provided to museums and historical sites that are outside of the provincial responsibilities, so those community museums, what are, do we have a, like a list of guidelines or a, a, you know, a metric or whatever, a, a rubric for application to that money? And like, are there specific things that um, requirements and um, sort of uh, responsibilities for those community organizations to receive funding from that pool, Pot? Deputy Houston? So, so the total is now approximately 1.5 million that go towards those community museum sites. Um, and so the short answer is yes, there is um, sort of a, a screening criteria or information that we ask. Like as I mentioned, we are tweaking that a little bit going forward so that we can try to be as more inclusive and sort of get a better assessment of what is out there. Um, but there is also requirements around reporting. So any kind of funding in terms of we're using taxpayer dollars and we want to make sure we're using them responsibly. So if we provide even a $5,000 grant to a community site, we need to see how that is spent and there's annual reporting that's required for them to then qualify for future, future funding. Emily LeBlanc, just under one minute. Well, thanks. Um, I guess that I will end my questions and just say um, that uh, I'm, you know, again, like not surprised. I mean, you won't be surprised by this, but I'm very pleased with this increase that was announced last year. I hope that we see in the coming budget session um, sort of a more kind of clear, uh, a clear mapping of how that money will be spent um, in terms of arts organizations uh, operating. You know, uh, is it going into solely operating? Are there new, are there new um, project grants? things happening. Um, but also I want to say that, um, you know, in terms of the art gallery, uh, I hope it's open soon. It's not a luxury. It's a necessity. It's a right. Order. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
And now we will move over to the uh, PC caucus. Uh, Emily Sheehy Richard will continue her questioning. So I'm going to refresh. Uh, we were talking about the model uh, of uh, museums that we have in our jurisdiction, and and I guess I was um, uh, just kind of elaborating a little bit. I lost my train of thought what we were talking about, but maybe some of the challenges and then the strengths of uh, the way that uh, we have ours more dispersed, if you will. Deputy Houston. Uh, certainly, I can start, and then Stephanie, if you want to mm -hmm. chime in on some of those strengths. So I, I think, obviously, one of the strengths of the system is that, you know, a lot of these um, um, a lot of these museums are rooted in community, are in some cases are run by community volunteer boards or have, you know, that are staff that are working in community. Uh, and so that always, I think, is that strong connection to the region, to the people, to the place. Uh, in some cases, we've got some staff who are, you know, the great, 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 great of, of you know, someone that was a part of that museum or was the heritage site. So um, I, I think also just v folks are very solution focused because it is so important for their communities it's like it's a get or done kind of attitude which is is a real strength of the system um, I think as well is that um, you know with the addition of the Acadian Village Highland Village uh, the Black Loyalist Center and we haven't had a chance to talk a lot around the Mi'kmaq while there isn't a dedicated Mi'kmaq Museum we are working very closely with Mi'kmaq to Burt and the Mi'kmaq there around developing their own museum system. Uh, we do support other areas like um, Millbrook Heritage Center, or, or, and there's another one in Member 2, where the Mi'kmaq are able to tell their own stories. So it's a good example of some of the strengths. I think some of the challenges um, are, of course, you know, with, with all these numbers, it does become the challenge of it is a large system. And so we're looking at ways that we can operate the most efficiently and fairly. Uh, across this province and um, you know I think uh, MLA Taggart uh, the pride that you have for the museum in your area or museums or heritage sites in your areas extends across this province and so uh, sometimes a part of the challenge is, is how do we how do we meet the needs of every uh, region and then uh, finally I would just say um, you know with the challenges that we're facing with some storms recently um, the, the unexpected is becoming in some ways the expected. So we are working hard to plan around that, but the nature and the extent of repair or damage that happens across the system. It's one thing if you're in a, you know, in a jurisdiction like Ontario where you have one provincial museum, okay. But when you have all these sites across the province, and like I said, we're managing about 240 assets, that includes vessels, that includes old historical buildings, um, it certainly is significant in terms of some of that upkeep. Emily Sheehy Richard. Well, if uh, Tom Taggart's passionate about his yeah. museum, <laughs> I, I feel like when we talked about earlier about you know opportunity to expand into the sh shoulder seasons and and things that might exist, and I'm just thinking like you know Windsor's been the birthplace of hockey, but we have not um, you know we have we we have not uh, you know really took that and run with it, in my opinion. I mean, we're hockey driven. I mean, the amount of people that came for the World Juniors. So, um, you know, with this new funding and, and things like that, like it would be a project that would be really uh, something that I would like to see we work on. I know Long Pond changed ownerships and is part of uh, some of the areas, part of the Kings Edge Hill School now. But, um, you know, I feel like we kept missing that boat and maybe, maybe there's opportunity to bring back bring it back and um, I just wanted to comment on the new app that you talked about the grant finder because I believe it was community services that I chaired that I think last year we talked about that coming through from the department so not only would that be great for these organizations but it's going to be fantastic for our CAs and ourselves as well so but the last thing before I let ML uh, pass it over to MLA <laughs> McDonald sorry um, I just want to talk about uh, how we get like heritage uh, day honorees total change of subject here but um, you know really proud William Hall uh, is named the 2024 you know first black person first Nova Scotia and third Canadian to ever get the Victoria Cross. Um, really significant, so proud of that. Um, but I'm just wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about how decisions like that are made and what the process is uh, uh, to getting to name and pick the honorees. Um, so you have nine minutes. Deputy Houston. Okay, so on, on the 
the process of designating someone for future heritage day i don't know the exact process offhand it is something that i we, do yeah and so, you, so so good so so do you want to speak to that actually can the chair speak to that uh, i i don't know if that's proper but it, it is school children who actually uh do choose them they send in their their yep. potential nominees and, um, and and there then is a committee which we help you know so we don't get them the Bodie mcboat face uh as the winner uh, but there is a committee that helps them review those and they are established out to i think we have it's 10 years out or something like that. There is a there is a number, and we've got kind of lined up for years going forward. So, and then if if I could, and sorry, MLA McDonald, I would like just to, to the, the the question <laughs> the question relative to uh, win, you know Windsor and the Hawk. I, I think uh, Stephanie has a great answer to that, that I think is, is helpful. Miss <laughs> Smith. Um, uh, just a few things about how Order. Burton House. Order. We, we oh. have a number of conversations going on in the room. If we could just um, keep it down a little bit so we can hear Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith. Um, Halliburton House Museum is a really good example for a lot of things that have been discussed here uh, just in the last few minutes. So season extension, um, it, it sits in a, you know, a wonderful park-like space <laughs> right in the middle of town. And they have extended the season, um, the use of that space, which is a government asset, um, for cross-country skiing. So they brought in a provincial organization uh, that that has purchased grooming equipment through our department and have this wonderful trail when there is snow. So that's a really good example of a site that's being maintained by the town, um, funded by the province, and being used for cross-country skiing. Um, they also have a disc golf uh, course there um, on site that's used for summer. So maximizing what is, you know, a traditional museum site and using it in a variety of ways is a really great example of collaboration and um, the town is to be credited for, you know, how they've worked together with us to make that happen. And on the hockey note, um, many years ago, uh, the Windsor Hockey Heritage Society was looking for a home. They, they couldn't afford a place. So we took a wing of Halliburton House and gave it to them so that they could have a warm <laughs> place for their a hockey collection. And so people go there to see the hockey um, exhibits, but then others will go see the historic house and vice versa. So it has put uh, visitation to that site you know, and in the tens of thousands, where it used to sit barely like two to three thousand a year. So hockey is being celebrated um, uh, on a provincial site in Windsor, and I just think it's a great example of uh, what can be done. Yeah. Okay, Emily Sheehy Richard, are you are you through with questioning now? Yeah. Well, I'll just think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that's great. I just, I just envision that, you know, uh, being bigger and better. But yeah, it is really great. And I don't know that I realized about the, uh, the cross country skiing, but uh, snowshoeing, I think, is is uh, happening there as well. So yes, I will turn it to Emily McDonald. For Emily McDonald, you have just under six minutes. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and um, I'll just comment on uh, my colleague over there. I've been to York Redoubt, and I'm very disappointed to hear what you said because I do remember it. I, I'm going to have to take a look out there. Um, and one thing I want to do is uh, your group, so for my area, it's the Fundy region, the, and I will tell you, your staff have been great. They actually came out and we did a Grant 101 thing. We had like 26 people show up, and everybody had positive things to say, even though not everybody gets money because there's only a limited amount. Um, and uh, just to put into Emily Taggart's point, so from the looks of it, we incurred the, uh, that budget could increase 70% from 900,000 to 1.5, which I think everybody here is happy over because everybody's got gr great groups. I mean, and you happen to mention great, great, great. Well, I have the Lawrence House in my area in Maitland, when Maitland is the first historical district in the province that was ever registered. And I do have people that are descendants of William Lawrence. And this year is the 150th anniversary of the launching of it. And Pardon me? What? Yeah, I know. Oh my God, it is. It is. It is. It is. It is. It is. No, it was launched in 1874. It was launched in 1874. 
and 150 yes. plus 1874. Oh. Yeah. Look at em that. Emily McDonald has the floor. Uh, I just ignore the all these people when I do that, <laughs> except when the chair says order, I stop and go I'm like what? So it was Emily launched McDonald. in 1874, and 150, and that is 2024, is it not? Yeah. Okay, just checking. <laughs> Look, <laughs> no, it's 150. It's 1800. Yeah, it was launched October 27th, 1874. That, and so, um, oh yeah, so it's a thing. So to get to my questions, um, I. <laughs> I could do what I want with my time. It's a great, it's a great portion of this. Uh, so, um, how is it that the uh, department is leveraging the museum and heritage to support tourism? So, what's the department doing for that? Deputy Houston, just over three minutes. Uh, no, it's it's a good question. We've touched on a little bit of that today, but I, I think. Um, there, uh, one thing that I'd like to kind of highlight is the interface, which I think is, you know, we've got now uh, tourism, uh, film, and culture and heritage all in one department. And to highlight on an example of some of the work that we're doing. So there are productions, <clears throat> um, notably uh, Washington Black, which will be screening on uh, Disney Plus here in the very near future. I spoke about this actually last week at a committee meeting. It's, it's poised to be one of the biggest series that's gonna be on Disney shortly. Uh, all filmed, you know, a lot of it filmed here in Nova Scotia and in rural sites. So in some of those places using actually museum sites uh, that were used for the filming uh, and then tying that into uh, tourism. So for example, it's as simple as when you're, this is the future now, when you're streaming that on Netflix, and then you go on your computer, there will be ads for Nova Scotia that will be able to come up. And being able to link those together, utilizing our assets, utilizing our amazing uh, film industry here, and then tapping into that for tourism to actually drive people to say, wow, I really liked what I saw on the screen. Oh, huh, interesting. It was filmed in Nova Scotia. I didn't know that. Let's maybe plan a trip. Um, so in particular, that what, what's interesting about that one is where it's the focus is on a, uh, it's a story of following, I won't ruin the punchline, but it's around kind of slavery and a, and a freed slave and, and uh, African American uh, coming to Nova Scotia. So there's a, a real interesting story there and in tapping into the, the market of, of African Americans and that tourism market in, in Northeast US in particular. We see huge potential there and it's a real good opportunity. Minute and a half, Emily McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I would agree. I've um, in my previous life, I've dealt with many Americans and uh, the Oak Island, the amount of them said, so have you been down there? And I'm going like, guys, it's not a place that you can just walk in anymore and go on. Um, so um, the, uh, the other thing is you had mentioned, you made a very clear distinction between when you said provincial and municipal heritage properties. What, why did you make such a distinction? And I'm just wondering, like, if one is a municipal, is it not a provincial also, or mm -hmm. is there two separate things? Uh, Deputy Houston? Yeah, it, it can be both. You can be registered as both. Um, the difference would be is that essentially, I'm boiling this down to make it, you know, for interest of time, is that one is of, is it of municipal interest from a heritage perspective, and other does it have provincial significance? So uh, I won't go into the details there, but you can distinguish the, kind of between the two. And there are, for example, many more municipal uh, heritage properties. I think, you know, Halifax might have about 1,300, and Nova Scotia we have closer, I think, 600 sites or yeah. 600 sites. So. It's a bit different, but the criteria we look at of are they of provincial significance from a histori historical perspective versus municipal? And yes, four yeah, seconds, yeah. Emily McDonald. Thanks a Order. lot. Burnt coat head is awesome. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you very much to our witnesses here today. Um, uh, I should. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the uh, heritage site in my own uh, area, Scott Manor House. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> since everyone was doing a little plug there, uh, and they have great programming all summer long. The uh, um, Deputy Houston, would you like to make some closing remarks? My closing remarks will be brief. I just want to thank everybody for the time here to talk about what uh, is a positive story for all Nova Scotians and all uh, areas of the province. Uh, I do appreciate um, the work that you and your constituents assistants do for your um, your citizens. And uh, I know, you know, I've worked with 
probably almost everybody around this table, and I encourage you and your colleagues to reach out if you ever have any questions or if you have community groups that are looking for uh, possible solutions to a great thing that they want to do to make your area better, don't hesitate to reach out. We're always there. Thank you very much. Now, I would, um, we will let our witnesses go out into the world. They don't have to hang around here while well, we do a, a tiny piece of, uh, of committee business. Uh, and that's correspondence from the Department of Service, Nova Scotia. It was information requested from the January 10th meeting. It, there's quite a bit of information there. I don't know if folks have had a chance to look through it. Um, any questions or comments about what is there or what is not there? Okay, uh, so just for folks' uh, information, the one, um, our next meeting is February 7th, 2024. Uh, the, the witness will be Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Department of Public Works, the Joint Regional Transportation Agency, Re Municipal Grant Funding and Strategic Initiatives. If there is no further business, any further, me, uh, any further, the Emily uh, McGuire? Sorry, I don't have a, do I have a list? Who's the witness for the Joint Regional Transportation Agency? Mark Pack? Mark Pack, yes, thank you. Um, so, and no further business? Well, then the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.